Section One of Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue Eleven, January the Thirteenth, eighteen eighty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue Eleven, January the Thirteenth, eighteen eighty. Jeanie Lowry, The Young Immigrant, by Miss F. E. Fryatt. It was early winter evening at Castle Garden, the scores of gas-jets that light the vast rotunda dimly showing the great hall deserted by all the bustling throngs of the morning, save the few women and children clustered around the glowing stove, and closely watched by the keen-eyed officials who smoked and chattered within the railings near them. Sitting apart from these, taking no notice of the gambols of the children, was a wee lassie of perhaps eight summers, her round, childish face drawn with trouble, and her great blue eyes brimful of tears. She was evidently expecting somebody, for her gaze was fixed on the door beyond, which seemed never to open. It was little Jeanie Lowry, waiting for her grandfather's return. Old Sandy Lowry, thinking to take advantage of their stay overnight in New York to visit his foster-son, who had left Scotland for America when a lad, had gone out into the afternoon into the great city, bidding Jeanie carefully guard their small luggage, a few treasures tied up in a silken kerchief, and Granny's precious umbrella which was a sort of heirloom in the family. While the great crowd surged to and fro, and the winter sunlight flooded the room, Jeanie had been content to watch and wait, half pleased and half frightened at the shouts and noises that filled the place on steamer day. But when the men, women, and children all went away by twos and threes, save a few, and silence came with the increasing darkness, and the dim gas-jets were lighted overhead, her heart, oppressed by a thousand fears, sunk within her, and she fell to sobbing bitterly. Now there were not wanting kind hearts in the little groups around the stove, for there was Mary Dennett, with her five laddies, going to join her husband at the mines in Maryland, and Janet Brown, her neighbour, with her three rosy lassies, and Jessie Lawson with her wee Davy. And not one of these three would see a child suffering without offering consolation. Kind Janet soon had her folded in motherly arms, in spite of the bundle and the great umbrella, which the lassie stoutly refused to part with for a moment. And Mary Dennett, crossing over to the counter on the far side of the room, bought her cakes and apples while the children, not to be outdone, made shy endeavours to beguile her into their innocent play. But to each and all of these Jeanie turned a deaf ear, moaning constantly, "'I want my ain, ain grandaddy. He hath gone awa and left me alone. O oh, grandaddy, come back to your Jeanie!' The evening wore on into night and still no Sandy came to comfort Jeanie. But there came that great consoler, sleep. Soon she slumbered in Janet's arms, and the kind soul, fearing to waken her, held her there till the beds for the little company were spread on the floor. Then she laid Jeanie tenderly down, with her treasures still clasped in her arms, and covering her, stooped to print a warm kiss on the round, tear-stained cheek, not forgetting to breathe a prayer for the missing Sandy's safe return. The snow glistened on the walks and grass plats of the park without. The wind roared down the streets and whistled among the bare branches of the trees, and, rushing along, heaped up the waters in huge billows, dashing them against the great stone pier. Men passed to and fro, but Sandy came not, 
for far off in the great city he had lost his way. In vain he had asked everyone to tell him where his foster-son Alec Deans lived. Meeting only laughter or rebuffs, he tried in the growing darkness to find his way back to Castle Garden, but could not. No one seemed to understand him, or cared to. So at last, worn out in mind and body, he sunk down on the stone steps of a house, unable to proceed a step further. Bright and early the next morning at Castle Garden, the women were roused from their sleep, for the beds must be rolled up and the place cleared for the business of the day, and all must be ready for the early train. In the confusion of preparing the children for breakfast and the journey, the women had forgotten Jeanie for the time, till suddenly Janet, spying her with her bundle and her umbrella, standing and casting troubled, wistful glances at the door, ran over and brought her to where the women and children were drinking coffee from great cups and eating rolls of brown bread and butter. Seating her in the midst of them, she said, "'Eat a bit of the bannock, dearie. Grandaddy will come back wi' a braw new bonnet for Jeanie, and then we'll all gang awa in the train together.' "'I dinna want a bonnet,' cried Jeanie. "'I only want Grandaddy.' "'Dinna greet, Bernie. He'll no leave ye lang no. But the old man, contrary to their hopes, failed to appear. So there rose a troubled consultation among the women regarding Jeanie. They had all lived neighbours to the Lowrys, a mile or so beyond the dyke, which is a stone's throw from the Duke's palace near Hamilton. The good men of their families, hearing great reports of the mines in America, and the times being hard for the miners at home, had gone out to verify them, Angus Lowry among the rest. All four had prospered, and now sent for their wives and bairnies. Young Lowry, however, was doomed to the bitter sorrow of never more seeing the bonny wife he had left behind him, for a fever had carried her off in her prime, so that Jeanie, her bairn, was left to the sole care of her grandfather, who loved her tenderly, as the older wont to love the young. While the women were in the midst of their dilemma, half resolved to carry off the lone bairnie privately, lest the officers should interfere, the superintendent, seeing some trouble was afoot, came over and soon settled the matter for there was a law on the subject that he was bound to obey. But we are quite forgetting old Sandy all this time. Seeing that he was lost, and there was no help for it that he should sit down in the particular spot he did, was a peculiar stroke of good fortune, for it was the very house he had been seeking, and what was most wonderful, just at that moment the door above opened, and down came Alec Deans, in time to hear Sandy's faint cry, "'God help my poor Jeanie!' Alec Deans had not heard the dear Scottish accent in many a year. So straight away that sound went to his very heart-strings, making them thrill and tingle with a joy that was as suddenly turned to pain. When stooping down, he found the old man fallen back as one dead. With little ado, for Sandy was small and thin, he lifted him bodily, carried him up the steps and rang a peal, which soon brought his wife to the door. Placing the old man on a sofa in the warm sitting-room where the light fell on his poor, pale face, Alec Deans in a moment recognised his foster-father and set to work to restore him. The long, stormy passage, and the trials incident to emigrant life on shipboard, added to the fatigue and fright of his night's wanderings, had so told on the old man's feeble frame, that after much effort on the part of Alec Deans to revive him, he could do no more than move restlessly 
murmuring, "'Poor Jeanie, poor wee Bernie Jeanie!' Before he could well tell his story, the most of it became known to his foster-son, for the commissioners, finding he did not return to Castle Garden, sending Jeanie weeping away to the refuge on Ward's Island, and notifying the police, advertised the missing man in the papers. It was on the second day, after Sandy's falling into such good hands, that Alec, reading the morning paper at his breakfast-table, saw the advertisement, describing Sandy to the very Glengarry cap he wore on his head when missing. In short order he made his way to the rotunda at Castle Garden, told the old man's adventure, and obtained a permit to bring Jeanie away from the refuge. There was an hour to spare before the little steamboat Fidelity would start for Ward's Island, so Alec, being a thoughtful man, employed it in purchasing a pretty fur hat and tippet and some warm mittens, lest Jeanie should suffer from cold for it was a bitter day to sail down the East River. When Alec, arriving at his destination, was taken into the long schoolroom, and saw the sad, pale-faced little creatures bending wearily over their lessons, stopping only to lift timid glances to his friendly face, as if they would gladly pour out their little hearts to him, he was filled with a great pity and a sharp regret that he could not take the wee things away with him, and give them each the shelter of as happy a home as that in which his own Femi bloomed and flourished. "'Jeanie Lowry, step this way, you are wanted,' exclaimed a teacher. Poor Jeanie! As she came reluctantly forward with downcast eyes, looked as if she feared some new disaster. Pale and dejected, could this be the blooming lassie who so short a time since parted with her grandfather? Jeanie, said Alec softly, I've come to take you to your granddaddy. Here's some warm things. Put them on and get ready. Oh, sir, may I gang awa from here to see my ain, ain granddaddy once mair? cried the lassie, the glow of a great joy dawning on her pale face and lighting her eyes. "'Yes, Jeanie,' said Alec brokenly. "'Home with my Femi. He's there.' "'There, do not cry. The trouble is all over,' said Alec soothingly, carrying her away in his arms and trying to stay the sobs that convulsed her small body. Arrived at Castle Garden, a new surprise awaited him and Jeanie, for who should be there, pacing up and down in his strong impatience to see the bairnie, but Angus Lowry. He had left his southern cottage, which was prepared for their arrival, and hastened on to know the fate of Sandy and Jeanie. And now he had his darling in his strong arms and so great was his joy that he could do little but press her to his breast, then hold her off and look into her eyes again and again, seeing mirrored there the eyes of his girl-wife Elsie, whom he had loved with a love he would bear to his grave. And now they must hasten to the dear old father, who had braved the perils of the wintry deep, that he might bring Elsie's one and only treasure to her husband, little recking that far away from kith and kin he should lay his old bones in a foreign land. If sorrow had had power to steal the roses from Jeanie's cheek, joy planted new and fairer ones there, and never did a brighter light dance in the blue eyes than when a little later, with a soft sound of rapture, she flung her arms around Sandy's neck, crying, "'My ain, ain grandaddy, ye shall never, never leave me ony mare!' Jeanie's presence did more to set old Sandy on his feet again 
than all the physic in the world. So in a few days the happy trio were whirling off to the mining village in Maryland, where they are living and prospering today. End of section one. Section 2 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13th, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Inigo. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13th, 1880. Lady Primrose by Fletcher Reed. Chapter 1. As it fell upon a day in the merry month of May. It was a long, long time ago that it happened, so long, in fact, that most people have forgotten all about it. But once upon a time, as the old, old stories tell, there lived in the village of Hollowbush an old woman and a little girl. And other people lived there, too, but that does not concern us. The old woman, plain and brown and wrinkled though she was, was the wisest and kindest old lady anywhere to be found, which is reason enough for her being in the story. And as for the little girl, you have already guessed that she is Lady Primrose. But how she came to be Lady Primrose is what makes the story. The village of Hollowbush was as pretty a place as you would care to see, a quiet, quaint little town where the grass ran up and down the streets in a wild, free way it had, to which no one thought of objecting. But as year after year went by, and the little girl who lived there grew older without, unfortunately, growing wiser, she became so tired of Hollowbush and its grass-grown streets that she was almost ready to run away. If I were only rich, she was constantly saying to herself, then I might go where I chose. Now it came to pass that one day, in the merry springtime, when the world is so sweet and fragrant that you can hardly put your nose out of doors without feeling as if you had tumbled head foremost into a huge bouquet, this little girl sat by the open window, wishing and wishing with all her might that she were rich. For then she said to herself. I could have a diamond necklace, and perhaps, she added, aloud, I might have a jeweled coronet, like a queen. Just then, the wise old woman of Hollowbush, who had the amiable peculiarity of appearing just when people most needed her, stopped before the window, and said, as she looked up at her young friend, You were wishing for a diamond necklace, my child? What would you do if I should tell you of a country where diamonds are as plenty as flowers are here? What would I do? And the child laughed at the idea of there being but one thing she could do. I would go to it at once and fill my hands with the shining beautiful things. But you don't mean that there really is such a place, she added after a pause. The old lady smiled and said, if you really love gems better than anything else in the world, I can tell you where to find all and more than all you want. That would be impossible, answered the child. I could never have more than enough, but what a beautiful country it must be. Do tell me where to find it. Still smiling, this wonderful old lady, who knew all manner of strange secrets, called the child to her, and having whispered in her ear, pointed in the direction of the woods just beyond the village. The girl's face looked serious, as if she were perhaps a little frightened at what the old lady had told her. But if she could get all the jewels she wanted, it was worth more than one fright, she thought. So off she started without a word. The shy little blossoms that hide their faces from the sunlight grew here and there in the woods. White star flowers and purple hepaticas nodded on their slender stems, while the crimson and white wood sorrel fairly ran wild, creeping in and out through bush and briar like a host of fairies in striped petticoats. A nice place enough, said the child, tossing her head. 
for those who know of nothing better but he can't stop to admire such simple things gems and jewels are the only flowers i care for the shadows were growing longer and deeper all around her for the sun was almost down and as she looked up through the trees she could see the pale face of the young moon peeping down at her through the branches oh if the wise old woman had only come with me said the child in a whisper the shadows took on strange ghostly shapes and the tall pine trees so high that their topmost branches seemed to rest against the sky sang softly and slowly and all together take care take care oh she had never realized before how full of sounds the stillness of the deep woods may be and it seemed to her as if the rustling of the leaves and the singing of the wind were strange unearthly voices calling out to her and warning her to go back but in spite of the rustling leaves and the mournful sighing of the pines the little girl hurried on perhaps just because of them she hurried all the faster for she felt quite sure that she was nearing the place to which she had been directed and in a few moments she saw just before her the gray moss-grown rocks piled one above another which the wise old woman of hollow bush had described and heard far below the rushing and tumbling of a brook surely i must have been deceived she thought here was no strange country sown with jewels but simply a rocky ravine where ferns waved in the wind clinging to the rocks and catching the spray from the water as it bubbled and hissed and fell in a snowy pool below this can't be the place said the child as she looked around but while i am here i may as well see what it is so she clambered over the loose stones and decaying logs till she reached the level of the stream and there strangely enough scattered among broken bits of granite were small bright stones of a deep wine color these are not diamonds she said to herself but they are too pretty to lie neglected here whatever they may be she gathered them one by one tying her handkerchief into four knots at the corners for a basket and so absorbed was she that she had quite forgotten the weird shadows and the strange noises in the wood until she was startled by a voice close beside her her heart gave a sudden bound as if it were going to jump away from her without so much as saying by your leave and turning quickly she saw not the old woman although the voice had sounded curiously like hers but a quaint pale-faced little man with small faded looking blue eyes that blinked in the moonlight as if the brightest of june day suns had been shining upon him so you are fond of gems my little maiden said the small man in a small thin voice winking and blinking good-naturedly as he spoke the child stood staring at her companion too much astonished to answer him a word for she nor you nor i i believe had ever seen such a curious being before he was so small that she could have tucked him under her arm and run away with him but his pale blue eyes had a strange light in them like nothing seen above the ground and she might have gone on staring at him from that day to this if her handkerchief had not slipped from her fingers letting her stones roll here and there over the ground whereupon she uttered a low cry of disappointment oh never mind those said the little man smiling they are nothing but garnets just come with me and i will show you stones a thousand times more beautiful so you live in a country where gems grow instead of flowers said the child recovering her voice and her self-possession at the same time yes he answered i am the keeper of the gate and if you will come with me i will show you more beautiful things than any you ever dreamed of this invitation was just what the child wanted and she followed the gatekeeper without another word what a strange place it was this country of his into which he was leading her it was so dark that she could see nothing but gleaming lights shining through the darkness 
red and yellow and green and crimson, like tiny magic lanterns hung at intervals high above her head against the wall. She began to perceive that they were going deep down under the earth, and she shivered, partly with cold and partly with fear, as she stepped carefully and slowly over the uneven path down which she and her guide were descending. Is it far we have to go? she asked at length, rather timidly. Oh, no, answered her companion. This is simply a long corridor that runs through the base of the hills, but we have almost reached the end of it. In a few moments, I shall lead you to the presence chamber of the king. The king, echoed the child, hardly knowing whether to be frightened or pleased. And am I going to go before a king? Yes, yes, laughed the little man. You don't suppose we are a people without a king? As he spoke, he knocked three times against the wall, and a voice from within called out, Who's there? Who's there? Who's there? Alec the gatekeeper, answered her companion, and immediately a door flew open. To be continued. End of section two. Section 3 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13th, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13th, 1880 wild boar hunting in japan by william elliot griffiths winter is the harvest time of the japanese hunter the snow-covered ground is a great tell-tale and the deer bears rabbits and wild hogs can be easily tracked though the japanese hunter often uses a matchlock or rifle his favorite weapons are his long spear and short sword he covers his head with a helmet made of plaited straw, having a long flap to protect his neck and keep out the snow or rain. His feet are shod with a pair of sandals made of rice straw. His baggy cotton trousers are bound at the calves with a pair of straw leggings, and in wet weather he puts on a grass rain cloak. To see a group of hunters stalking through the forests in Japan, as I have often seen them, reminds one of bundles of straw out on a tramp. I once enjoyed a dinner of fresh boar steak at the house of a famous Japanese hunter named Nakano Kawachi, who lived in a village at the top of a mountain, between the provinces of Omi and Echizen. I had been travelling all the morning on snowshoes through the forests of Echizen. The snow was full of tracks of deer, hogs, rabbits, woodchucks, weasels, martens, porcupines monkeys and ferrets the hunters were out in force and their shouts made the forest ring with echoes our path lay through a valley with rocks on either side just as we were within a mile of a village named tonnet a wild boar closely pressed by a man with a spear rushed down through the woods and around a huge mass of rocks the hunter knowing every inch of the ground sprang round a shorter curve and reached the path at the end of the gully just as the boar at full trot leaped down levelling his long weapon with all his might he drove the blade with a terrific lunge between the boar's ribs just back of the heart so great was the impetus of the swift animal that the hunter was nearly taken off his feet while the boar turned a complete somersault we expected to see the blade of the land snap or the handle wrench off but no steel and wood were too true the boar struggled and rolled over the bloody snow but was helpless to get on his feet again the hunter quietly drew out the steel wiped it with a bunch of dead leaves and then with equal coolness drew his sword and severed the jugular vein of the dying boar by this time the hunter's two sons who had helped to start the animal from his lair came down the hill passing two strands of rope made of rice straw round the carcass they inserted a thick bamboo pole under the withes then swinging the pole over their shoulders 
they started off on a dog trot to the village shouting as they went we followed them and when near the village gate heard a bedlam of unearthly yells and whoops of triumph from all the boys and girls of the village who were proud of their famous hunter we had entered into conversation with him and learned that his name was nakano kawachi our party at the invitation of the hunter entered his house first taking off our shoes we all sat round the fire which was in a great square hearth in the middle of the floor while the chimney was a gaping black funnel in the ceiling my party consisted of three of my students from the government school of fukui my interpreter a brave soldier named inouye and my body servant sahei the six mountaineers with huge wide snowshoes whom i hired for the size of their feet to bear a pass in the snowdrift for our party remained outside with the villagers they with their children stood in crowds outside to catch a sight of me as they had never seen an american before our host first unstrapping his sword carefully wiped and cleansed his spear which he stands on its iron butt in the corner we all sit around the fire on which turnips and rice are boiling and omelette is frying all around the ceiling from the smoky rafters hang strings of large dried persimmons almost as sweet and luscious as figs these we munch while nakano cuts tenderloin steaks from half the carcass of a boar which he speared the day before in a few moments seven hungry travellers are watching the sputtering sizzling boar steak as it wafts its appetizing odours everywhere as it seems but up the chimney is this the second wild hog you've speared this winter asks iwabuchi the interpreter no your honour answers nakano the snow began to fall ten days ago and this is the eighth hog i have killed but yesterday i speared my first boar this winter how long have you been a hunter hi your honour ever since i was a boy i speared my first hog when i was fifteen what do you do with the boar's tusks hi your honour they are the most valuable part of the animal i sell them to an agent of an ivory carving shop in tokyo who comes through these parts in the spring the tokyo men carve nitsukes from them they are not as good as ivory but they do for bimbo poor man my own nitsuke is of boar's tusk meshi shitaku rice is ready cried the housewife at this moment and conversation was suspended a little table of lacquered wood a foot square and four inches high was set before each man of our party with chopsticks for the rice and knives for the boar steak we partook of the hunter's fare the march of eight miles in the frosty air plodding our way through drifts and stepping on snowshoes which furnished good exercise for our legs had made us ravenously hungry when full and all had said mo yo shio even enough to the polite girls who waited on us we walked out to the front where a gaping crowd gazed at the american white face as if they were at barnum's and he was the tattooed man i rushed at them pretending to catch the children when they scattered like sheep in their fright they tumbled over each other until a dozen or more were sprawling on the snow or had tumbled head foremost in the drifts a smile and the distribution of some sugared cakes of peas and barley made them good friends again after an hour's rest we bade the hunter the villagers and our snowshoe man good-bye and resumed our journey in single file over the mountains to tokyo End of section three. Section four of Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue Eleven, January Thirteenth, eighteen eighty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vicki Pelton estes park colorado w w w dot curious bunny dot com harper's young people volume one issue eleven january thirteenth eighteen eighty seeking his fortune by mrs w j hayes a boy sat whistling on a fence he was a lad of twelve years and worked at all sorts of odd chores on the river farm which sent most of its produce 
down to the city on the barges, which one sees on the Hudson River. Headed by little steam tugs, which are commonly called tows. This boy, Tom Van Wick, was a poor boy and worked hard. He did not much care for the beautiful hills which encompassed the winding, gleaming river, nor the fair and fertile fields beyond. But he had an adventurous and daring spirit, which just now was working up in the manner of yeast when it is pushing its way through the mass of unbaked bread. All sorts of bubbles were bothering his brain, and foremost was the wish to leave his country home and go to the great city of which he had heard so much, but about which he knew little. Aunt Maria, he was sure, would never say yes to his project. She looked upon the city as a great den of thieves, and she did not want Tom to go there. But he was tired of being a farmhand, and thought it would be fine to stand behind a counter, to wear kid gloves on a Sunday, to be able to buy good broadcloth and shining boots. Indeed, with one bound to be a merchant prince, whose grandeur should be the town talk. He had not very clear ideas as to how all this would be attained, but he knew he could work hard. He had read how many a poor boy had struggled up to fame, and he meant to try, anyhow. And now, as he sat on the fence, whistling, he was considering a plan of action. There was no use in being too tender-hearted. He would have to leave Aunt Maria without asking permission. True, the little red house by the hill was a snug little home, and his aunt toiled hard to make it so. But would he not come home to her with silks and diamonds, which should so outshine her best alpaca that it would only do for common use? Often, down at the dock, he had talked with the men on the boats, but he knew none of them other than as Jack and Bill. His proposed plan was to leave some night quietly, get on a barge, go to the city, and secure work, then ride home to Aunt Maria and make his peace with her. Perhaps if Aunt Maria had known all these thoughts, she might have been less harsh when Tom scolded about farm work and called it drudgery. But she had a scornful way of sniffing at him and his ideas, which made Tom more and more close and reserved. On this very day, when the momentous project was ripening, she had said he was lazy, that a rolling stone gathered no moss, that the boy was father to the man, and that if all he could do was whistle and whittle, he had better go over to Squire Green's and help them shuck their corn. Shuck corn? In a week's or a month's time, he'd show her what he could do. It was a clear October night, calm and beautiful, and Tom rose softly, tied his best suit up in a bundle with a couple of shirts, took off his shoes, he had not undressed, slipped downstairs, unfastened the door, which, however, was only latched, and crept out into the moonlight. He paused to count the few silver pieces in his little well-worn purse, took one long look at the red house, and especially at the window, where little Jane's yellow head was oftenest to be seen, for Aunt Maria was mother as well as aunt to these two motherless children, and away he went. If he had any qualms of conscience, they were soon forgotten in the excitement of the moment. The walk was not a long one to the riverside, and he had made a right guess as to the time the night boat would land. One by one, a sleepy head appeared from the sheds as the boat neared the wharf. But despite the moonlight, no one noticed him particularly as he slipped stealthily on board, and to his great relief, the truck was soon shipped. The gangplank drawn up, and the steamboat making its white furrow through the sparkling water. He was too wide awake now to think of sleeping, and after paying his fare, sat down to watch the progress of the boat. By and by, the moon sank, and it was dark. The chilly dawn soon came, and then long rows of sparkling lights appeared, the tall spires of the town, the mass of the shipping, the flitting ferry boats, each with its green or scarlet blaze of lantern, Rows of housetops, docks, wharves, flagstaffs, sheds. This, then, was the great city of his hopes. Now there was a stirring and calling, a rush of men to the work of unlading, a heaving of ropes, 
whining of cables, shouts, curses, the rattling of carts on the piers, the tinkle of bells on the cars, the roar of escaping steam, the scream of whistles, and the foul smells of garbage and bilge water. He watched the men at the work. He saw the passengers come out with sleepy eyes and sodden faces and take their departure. He too must go, but where? He wandered off the pier in a maze. Where should he go? What should he do in all this crowd of strange faces? He was hungry and stopped at an apple stand where a woman in a huge cap and plaid shawl sold him an apple and a molasses cake. He asked her if she knew where he could get work. Sure, and I don't. It is hard enough to find it for my boy Jim, letting alone strangers. He went up to a man pitching boxes on a cart and asked him the same question. Be off now. None of your nonsense with me, was the reply. To a dozen he spoke, and with little variety in the replies. This was somewhat disheartening, but of course he could not expect success at once. He must keep up a stout heart. So on he walked. It was a fine, clear morning, but the air seemed to him heavy with bad odors, and he had never seen such filth as lay in the streets before him. The children looked wan and wizened and old, the grown people cross and careworn. But by and by the streets improved. He came to the region of shops where it was somewhat cleaner, and now every window attracted his gaze. There was so much to look at that he forgot himself until hunger again attacked him. One window was most inviting, raw oysters reposing on their shells, boiled eggs, salad, strings of sausages, and a juicy array of pies. He went in and asked the price of a dinner. Fifty cents, was the reply, of a personage whose florid countenance and well-oiled locks looked unctuous. Tom glanced at his purse in a corner. It was all he possessed, so he turned away. A little farther on was another window of the same sort, only the pies looked drier, and the viands staler, and as an ornament, flanked by beer bottles, was a queer, dwarfish-looking man built of empty oyster shells. He peered into the shop and looked so hungry that a man shouted at him in a manner that was not meant to be unkind, but which startled him much. What for you comes here, eh? Can you open oysters? We want some one to open two or three hundred. We have one supper here tonight. The Bavarian brooders meet. If you can do the work, you may have von Gut square meal. Tom Harley understood the man, but the jesters aided him, and putting his bundle down, he set to work on the cellar steps. Talk of farm work being drudgery any more. In the pure, sweet October air, they were gathering apples for the cider press today. Tom remembered well what would have been his portion as he sat on the dirty cellar steps and pegged away with his oyster knife. It took him a long while to get the right touch, to clip off the muddy edge of the shells, to pry into the bivalve without injury to the luscious morsel within, and then to slip it into the big tin pail at hand. He got a bad cut in the palm as he did it, but he bound it up with his handkerchief, finished his score, and asked the man for his dinner. You tink I give you von plate and knife and fork and a napkin? No. Go to work at the oysters, and here is brood a plenty. So he had to take his meal as he could get it on the cellar stairs. But he stowed away enough to satisfy him before he again started on his travels. The food revived his drooping spirits, and he made bold to ask more people for work. Some shook their heads without a word. Some said, no, my boy, in a kind sort of way. That made a lump come in his throat. Others told him to go to the place assigned to evil spirits. And others again stared at him and passed on. This was not very promising. It was now late in the day, and he was far from the steamboat landing. He knew nobody and was just wondering where he should pass the night when a boy with a box strung by a leathern strap over his shoulder jostled him. He was a rough fellow, about his own age, but there was a twinkle in his eye which emboldened Tom to speak to him. Do you know where I can get any work to do? 
The boy put his fingers aside of his nose, winked violently, and made a grimace, but said nothing. I'm in earnest, said Tom. I want work badly. Yes, in my eye, was the response, regarding Tom's more decent apparel. Oh, but I do. What is your trade? Now see here, feller citizen, if you've any idea of coming on my beat, I just warn ye, ye'd better get at once. And he shook his fist in Tom's face to make the reply more emphatic. But I have not, said Tom anxiously. I only want work of some sort, and a decent lodging. I'm just for the country, and don't know a soul in this town. Besides, I've hurt my hand, and it pains a good deal. Let's see. I'm a crack doctor on all the feller's cuts. Tom unbound his hand, and the youthful Escalipius gazed at it with great interest. That'll knock you up yet, was the comforting diagnosis, with a wise shake of the head. Bad place to get a cut. Jim Jones had one just in that spot, and it festered, and hurt him, so he had to go to the hospital. Pshaw, said Tom. You better get your granny to poultice it. I tell you, I don't know a human being in the city, and I haven't an idea where I'm going to sleep tonight. The boy surveyed him doubtfully. You might go to the station house. Not if I know it, said Tom, whose visions of grandeur, though dimmer, were not to be brought down so low. Then there's the newsboy's lodging house. Could I get in there? But I don't know the way. Come along with me. I'll show you. I sleep there most of the time. This was, indeed, unforeseen good fortune, and Tom embraced it heartily. As they walked along, Tim got out of him his whole story, and when it was finished, he said to him, You were a big fool to leave a good home and try your luck here. For one that swims, a hundred sinks. Why, half the time I'm hungry. And the way we fellers gets knocked about is just awful. They reached the lodging house, and Tom, with his companion's aid, registered his name, got his ticket, and secured a bed. He was so tired he could hardly speak, and the pain in his hand was increasing. In the morning, his friend had gone. The matron, seeing his suffering, dressed his hand, and led him on to tell her who he was and what was his errand to the city. Kindly and patiently, she pointed out to him the great wrong of his beginning, the wickedness of leaving his aunt in ignorance of his whereabouts, the mistake of supposing that it was an easy matter to work one's way up from obscurity to places of trust and honor, that if his endeavors were sanctioned by those in authority over him and kind friends were willing to assist him and procure him occupation, he yet would find that it would only be by patient labor and constant effort that he could maintain himself, and that larks ready cooked no longer dropped into open mouths. All this and more came home to the sorrowful Tom with great force, for the dirt and jargon of the city were to him very distasteful. His castles were crumbling as he wended his way again to the docks. It was a weary time he had to find the boat which would carry him back, and it was with a grieved spirit that he found himself again at the door of the little red house by the hill. Grieved and weary and hungry, Aunt Maria, whose eyes were red with weeping, perceived him to be, and with wonderful wisdom, she kept down her questions and silently made him comfortable. Little Jane was full of curiosity, and more than one neighbor put their heads in to have a word to say. A year afterward, as Tom... Ned Green and Jonas were busy husking corn in the calm stillness of the fall when the stacks were all about them like Indian wigwams and the stubble only of the golden pumpkins was left in the field and the beautiful river wound itself away in the distance bearing all kinds of craft. Tom told them about his day in the city and said he had concluded that the country was good enough for him and he meant to be a farmer all the days of his life. End of section four. Recording by Vicki Pelton. Estes Park, Colorado. www.curiousbunny.com
section five of harper's young people volume one issue eleven january thirteenth eighteen eighty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b harper's young people volume one issue eleven january thirteenth eighteen eighty a great cathedral i remember well when a child hearing the cathedral of st peter in rome spoken of as being so immense that i thought of an ideal cathedral little less than a mountain in size and the dome to be seen only as if looking at the stars when the real cathedral was seen of course that exaggerated idea had then long been tempered to something like the reality yet it was not without a certain pleasure to find that to get a good view particularly of the dome it was necessary for me to go from it several miles to the pincian hill or a terrace of the beautiful villa doria pamphili the latter view is one of the finest as nothing else of all rome is seen the cathedral stands on the site of nero's circus where many christians were martyred and where the apostle peter is said to have been buried after his crucifixion in the year ninety an oratory was built there and in three hundred six emperor constantine erected a church it was the grandest of that time and exceeded in size all existing cathedrals except two yet was only half the size of the present building this cathedral was begun in fifteen hundred six and after forty years all the foundations were not built then michelangelo though seventy-two years old was persuaded to be the architect his predecessor had wasted four years in making a model of the proposed edifice at a great cost but he with marvellous energy completed his model in a fortnight though the work went rapidly on he knew he could not live to see his cathedral finished and he patiently made a wooden model of the great dome of exact proportions from this model his idea was carried out twenty popes came and went pressing the work to completion eighteen architects planned and replanned and expended one hundred million dollars brought from the four quarters of the globe and a hundred and fifty years rolled around before st peter's was finished sixtus v employed six hundred men night and day ceaselessly at work until the dome the cathedral was consecrated on the eighteenth of november sixteen twenty six the thirteen hundredth anniversary of a similar rite in the first cathedral it covers two hundred twelve thousand three hundred twenty one square feet of ground nearly twice the area of the next largest cathedral that of milan which is a little larger than st paul's of london its length is about equal to two ordinary city blocks its width to that of a short block and its total height that of a long block or a little less than the height of the great pyramid of egypt the circumference of the base of the dome is such that two hundred ten-year-old boys and girls clasped hand to hand would just about stretch around it the dome rests upon four buttresses each seventy feet thick and above them runs a frieze carved in letters as high as a man then one above another are four galleries from the lower one of which a fine view of the inside of the church can be had the little black things seen crawling on the pavement away down below are grown men and women the whole inside of the dome is of mosaic work and set in this are mosaics of the evangelists colossal figures you may know as the pen which st luke holds is seven feet long the roof of the cathedral is reached by means of an easy slope up which one could ride on a donkey emerging on the roof all rome is seen the country from the mountains and the blue mediterranean sea in the distance the roof holds a number of small domes and dwellings for the workmen and custodians who live there with their families but stranger still is a fountain fed from the rain caught upon the roof there we would be as high as the top of many church steeples but away above us like a whole mountain would rise the dome with a little copper ball on the summit if our courage and knees did not fail us we would ascend to that ball by staircases between the internal and external walls of the dome 
and find it large enough to hold a score of persons so vast is the cathedral's interior that it has an atmosphere of its own in winter slowly losing the heat of the preceding summer and in summer slowly warming up for another winter in cold weather the poor of rome go there for comfort as a roman winter sometimes brings frosty days and ice a traveller says he once saw a great sheet of ice around the fountain before the cathedral and some little romans awkwardly sliding on it for the sake of doing what he never thought to do in rome he took a slide with them the mosaic pictures statues and monuments are almost numberless and the pavement of coloured marble stretches away from the doors like a large polished field formerly on easter and june twenty eighth the dome facade and the colonnades of the cathedral were illumined in the early evening by the light of between four and five thousand lamps it was called the silver illumination and is described as having been very grand and delicate suddenly on a given signal four hundred men stationed at their posts exchanged the lamps for lighted pitch in iron pans fastened to the ribs of the dome then the dome shone afar as a splendid flaming crown of light the lynx an ugly and savage member of the great cat family is the lynx a creature very numerous in canada and in the wild forests of our most northern states it is found all over northern europe as well and in germany and switzerland a smaller variety called the swamp lynx is also an inhabitant of persia syria and some portions of egypt the canada lynx is a beast about three feet long with a short stub tail and might easily be mistaken for a large wild cat its fur which is short and very thick and of a beautiful silver gray is much used for muffs tippets and fur trimming the lynx is a cowardly beast and seldom attacks anything larger than hares squirrels and birds it will sometimes rob a sheepfold as the gentle and pretty lambs have no means of defence against its terrible claws it is very much hunted for its valuable fur and some years thousands of these beautiful skins are sent to market the ears are very curious having a tuft of bristling hair on the very point indeed this ear ornament is a distinguishing characteristic of all the varieties of the lynx tribe the large and powerful dogs which are found in canada and the northern portions of michigan minnesota and other border states where they are used as trained dogs to drag the mail sledges over vast wastes of snow during the winter are natural enemies of the lynx and pursue it furiously through the snow-bound forests their loud barking often warns the hunter before he himself catches sight of the game that the desired prize is treed and awaits its fate with arched back and fur bristling after the manner of an enraged cat the canada lynx is a very stupid beast and easily trapped a method of catching it generally adopted by the hudson bay company as in this way its beautiful fur is uninjured by bullets the european lynx is a much larger stronger and more ferocious beast than its canadian brother its great hairy paws are like those of the lion and tiger which strange as it may seem are also members of the pussycat family it lives in wild siberian forests where large numbers of trappers subsist on the proceeds of its valuable fur in norway and sweden in switzerland and also in other countries where wild forests exist vast numbers roam through the steppes of asia and the uninhabited portions of the eastern world so much is this creature dreaded in switzerland for its depredations on the flocks that the shepherds whose sheep feed on the mountain pastures do all in their power to exterminate this cruel enemy of their fold and a prize is offered by the government for every one killed driven by hunger the european lynx will often attack deer and other large animals a story is told of a lynx in norway which much against its will was forced to take a furious ride on the back of a goat the winter had been very severe and failing to find food in the forests and rocky barrens a young lynx spied a flock of goats feeding among the dry stubble of a field giving a quick spring it landed on the back of a large goat 
with the purpose of tearing open the arteries of its neck its method of killing large animals but the goat feeling its unwelcome rider set out at a gallop for the farmyard followed by the whole herd all bleeding in concert the claws of the lynx had become so entangled in the heavy beard of its intended victim that escape was impossible and the farmer by a skilfully aimed shot put an end to its life patience is largely developed in the lynx it will lie stretched out for hours on a branch of a tree watching for its prey if anything approaches it crouches and springs should the rabbit or bird escape the lynx never pursues but slyly creeps back to its branch and resumes its patient watch when captured very young lynxes may be trained and have been known to live on friendly terms with domestic animals such as dogs and cats but they are never healthy away from their native woods and usually die in a short time even in the wild state the lynx is short-lived and is said rarely to reach the age of fifteen years in confinement the lynx never thrives specimens kept in menageries never become friendly but grow sullen and suspicious spending the day in sleep at night they walk restlessly up and down their cage giving vent to hideous howls and yells the glistening piercing eyes of the lynx were formerly the subject of strange superstitions in the days of pliny it was known to the romans by the same name it still bears specimens were first brought to rome from gaul the country now called france and so terrible was the glaring eye that it was said to be able to look through a stone wall as through glass and to penetrate the darkest mysteries hence no doubt the expression lynx-eyed which is so often used to indicate keen and sharp watchfulness from which nothing can escape end of section five Section 6 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13, 1880. The Dead Letter Office. By Mrs. P. L. Collins. Of course, dear readers, all of you have heard of the Dead Letter Office at Washington, and I suppose you have the same vague idea that I had, until I went there and learned better, that it is a place where letters are sent when they fail to reach those for whom they are intended, and are thence returned to the writers. Really, now, I believe this is what most grown-up people think, too, but in truth, it is such a wonderful place that I am sure you will be surprised when I tell you of some of the things that you may find there, and I think when you come to Washington, it will be one of the first places you will wish to visit. Probably you have never written a great many letters, and I do not doubt that each one had its envelope neatly addressed by your father or mother, while you stood by to see that it was well done. I hope, too, that in due time your letters had the nice replies they deserved. You would have been much disappointed if any of them had been lost in the mail, as some people say, wouldn't you? You will not forget your stamp, I am sure, after I have related the following incident. There was once a little girl, only ten years old, who was spending six months in the city of New York, just previous to sailing for Europe. Her heart was filled with love for her darling grandpapa, whom she had left in New Orleans, and she wrote to him twice every week. Her letters were in the French language, at least the one I saw was, and it began, Cher Grand Pierre Chéri. She said, I hope that you have received the slippers I embroidered for you, and the fifteen dollars I sent in my last letter to have them made. But alas, the package containing the slippers had reached the cher grand pierre chéri, while the letter and money were missing. Then the old gentleman wrote to the dead letter office, and said that it was the only one of his granddaughter's letters he had ever failed to receive, that it could not have been misdirected, and his carrier had been on the same route for many years, so he knew him to be honest. Therefore the money must have been mysteriously swallowed up in the DLO. What was to be done? Do you imagine the dead letter office a shook in its shoes? not a bit of it. It turned to a big book and found a number which stood opposite the little girl's letter, and then straightway laid hands upon the letter itself and forwarded it to the indignant Grandpère. Now why all this trouble and delay in saying of naughty things to the DLO, without which he might never have either his letter or his money? Simply this, 
the dear child had dropped the letter into the box without a stamp you will be surprised to learn that something over four millions of letters are sent to the dead letter office every year there are three things that render them liable to this first being unclaimed by persons to whom they are addressed second when some important part of the address is omitted as james smith maryland third the want of postage all sealed letters must have at least one three cent stamp unless they are to be delivered from the same office in which they are mailed when they must have a one or two cent stamp according to whether the office has carriers or not for the second cause mentioned above sixty five thousand letters were sent to the dead letter office during the past year for the third three hundred thousand and three thousand had no address whatever when these letters reach the dead letter office they are divided into two general classes viz domestic and foreign the latter being returned unopened to the countries from which they started the domestic letters after being opened are classed according to the contents those containing money are called money letters those with drafts money orders deeds notes etc minor letters and such as enclose receipts photographs etc subminers letters which contain anything even a postage stamp are recorded and those with money or drafts are sent to the postmaster where the letters were first mailed for them to find the owners and get a receipt from thirty five thousand dollars to fifty thousand dollars come into the office in this way during the year but a large proportion is restored to the senders and the remainder is deposited in the united states treasury to the credit of the post office department when letters contain nothing of value if possible they are returned to the writers there are clerks so expert in reading all kinds of writing that they can discern a plain address where ordinary eyes could not trace a word for instance you could not make much of this example a dead letter clerk at once translates it mr henson king tobacco stick dorchester county maryland in haste and such spelling would you ever imagine that galveston could be tortured into carlsdon connecticut into canadicate and territory into tier tor recently the postmaster general has found it necessary to issue very strict orders about plain addresses and a great many people have tried to be witty at his expense i copied this address from a postal card arden simmons savannah township ashland county state of ohio age twenty nine occupation lawyer politics republican longitude west from troy two degrees street maine number two forty nine box one thousand eight color white sex male ancestry domestic president eighteen eighty u s grant about once in two years there is a sale of packages which are detained in the office for the same reason that letters are all the small articles are placed in envelopes on which are written brief descriptions of their contents any one is allowed the privilege of examining them before purchasing there are thousands of these packages containing almost everything you can think of i glanced over an old catalogue and selected at random half a dozen things that will give you an idea of the endless variety florida beans surgical instruments cat skin boy's jacket map of the holy land two packages of cornstarch and a diamond ring in truth as the chief of the dlo says in his report everything from a small bottle of choice perfumery to a large box of limburger cheese but there were two things that nobody would ever buy so this great institution was obliged to keep them one was a horrid grinning skeleton head that had been sent to dr gross the eminent philadelphia surgeon but the box being nailed so that the postmaster could not examine its contents without breaking it he was obliged to charge letter rates of postage which the doctor refused to pay consequently it found a proper resting place in the house appropriated specially to dead things occupying the same shelf are several glass jars containing serpents of various sizes preserved in alcohol these snakes were received at the dlo in two large tin cans the ends of which were perforated to admit air they were addressed to a professor in germany it could not be ascertained at what office they had been mailed there were seventeen in all but some of the smaller ones were dead system punctuality industry belong to the dead letter office it seems to embrace every other branch of business and as i have shown you even to know how to treat such unwelcome guests as a nest of live serpents end of section six section seven of harper's young people volume one issue eleven january thirteenth 
1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vicki Pelton. Estes Park, Colorado. www.curiousbunny.com. Harper's Young People. Volume 1. Issue 11. January 13, 1880. How Mother Robin Called a New Mate by E. J. Edwards. A friend of mine has a robin's nest that he guards with very great care, and about which he tells a story to all the young and old people who call upon him. There is a romance, he says, as he shows you the nest, about this, and if you want to hear it, I will tell it to you. It was a good many years ago, my friend begins, that this nest was made. There came one morning early in April, two robins to the big fir tree in front of my window. One of them had, as sure as you live, a club foot, and he hobbled about upon it in a very lively manner. And I know that it was this one, Mr. Robin, I call him, that fixed upon the precise place for the nest, for he wetted his bill upon a bough a great many times. Then he danced upon it with one foot and the other, as though trying its strength. And at last he flew up to Mrs. Robin, who was standing on the limb above looking at him. My window was open, and I heard him peeping the gentlest little song to her that you can imagine. Then she jumped down upon the limb, rubbed her bill upon it, and danced while he looked at her. And after she had done these things, she sang the same little melody. After that, they flew away with great speed. And the next that I saw of them, they were working with might and main, bringing twigs, moss, twine, and all sorts of things, until at last they had the nest made. Now my friend, when he gets so far in his story, always stops a moment and laughs, though you cannot see anything to laugh at. But he looks closely at you, and just as soon as he observes the surprise that your eyes show, he says, I ought to say right here that my mother had a very choice piece of lace, a collar or something of that sort, that was washed and put out upon a little bush to dry on the very day that Mr. and Mrs. Robin decided to build the nest in the fir tree. A great fuss was made that evening because the lace collar could not be found, and mother wanted the police called so that the thief might be arrested and the collar got back, for that collar was worth, I have heard, a great many dollars but the police never found the thief. Now I will go on with my story, always continues my friend, and he generally takes the nest in his hands at this time. Well, after this nest, this is the very one I hold in my hand, was built, you never saw a more attentive lover than this Mr. Robin. He would hop about on his club foot and seem to put his eye right upon an angleworm's cave every time he flew down to the ground and you might see him from early morning to sunset, flying back and forth with his mouth full of good things for Mrs. Robin, and he would feed her as she sat upon the nest. One day he seemed especially excited and happy. You could hear him singing in the tree more loudly than before, and I could see from my window the cause of his joy. Four yellow mouths were put up to receive the dainties he had brought, and then I knew that the little robins had come. Well, old Mr. Robin was so excited that he did not see our cat stealthily coming, as he was pulling away at a very long angleworm. Pussy had him in her mouth before he could even give a warning cry, and the last I saw of Mr. Robin was the club foot that hung out of Puss's mouth. By and by, Mrs. Robin seemed to get hungry, and I heard her uttering two strange notes that I had never heard before in which seemed to me to sound just as though she was saying, Come here! Come here! Of course, that was not what she said, but I have no doubt that the notes meant just that, and that every robin that might have heard them would have understood them as a call for help. But no robin came. It rained all that day, and poor Mrs. Robin kept up that cry, and her young ones continually thrust their bills from beneath her body and opened them. I could not help them, of course, 
for little birds would rather starve than be fed by anyone but their parents. Now I am coming to the strangest part of my story, my friend always says when he reaches his point. The next morning was clear, and I happened to be up early. Old Mrs. Robin had begun her plaintive call. Suddenly saw a great many robins, no less than twenty, I should say, that had come together from some place and rested upon the branches of a great elm tree that was only a few yards away from the fir tree. Of all the noises I have heard from birds, those that these robins made were the strangest. At last they were quiet, and two of them flew off to the fir tree and cautiously made their way to the nest. Mrs. Robin looked at them and sang a little trill. One of the visitors, with much shaking of his head, sang something in reply, and then the other one did the same. Mrs. Robin repeated her trill, and then she hopped up to the branch above and sang another note or two, and the smaller of the two robins took his place beside her. Then the other robin flew away to his companions, and after singing a little, they all went off together. When I looked back to the nest, Mrs. Robin sat there perfectly quiet, and, not more than a minute after, the new Mr. Robin brought a worm, and he was from that time until the little ones got their feathers and flew off as kind and attentive to Mrs. Robin as had been poor old club-footed Mr. Now isn't this a pretty love story, my friend inquires, and of course you say it is, and then ask him why he laughed, and what his mother's lace collar had to do with it, and he will answer you in this way. Look at the nest. See what lies at the bottom, where the little robins nested. I got the nest after they all flew away together, and there in the bottom was my mother's lace collar. Not good to wear any longer, so I have let it stay there ever since. Do you suppose young robins ever had such a costly bed? End of Section 7 Recording by Vicki Pelton Estes Park, Colorado W www.curiousbunny.com Section 8 of Harper's Young People Volume 1 Issue 11 January 13, 1880 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vicki Pelton, Estes Park, Colorado, www.curiousbunny.com, Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13, 1880, Charlie Bennett's Ghost Story, by Mrs. Margaret Itinge. It is a sin to steal a pin, as well as any greater thing sang little Al Smith in a loud, shrill voice. Very good sentiment, but very poor rhyme, drawled Hen Rowe, whose father was a poet, patting the singer's flaxen head in a patronizing manner. Talking of stealing, said Charlie Bennett, dropping the pumpkin he was turning into a lantern, did I ever tell you fellers about the time I went down to old Pop Robbins to steal apples? and came back past the barn, where the horse thief hung himself years and years ago, because he knew the constables, they called them constables in those times, were after him, and that he'd be hung by somebody else if he didn't? No? Here's a ghost story for you, then, and I hope it will be a warning to you all never to take anything that doesn't belong to you, especially apples. You see, Billy Evans and I were staying with our folks at the hotel in Bramblewood that summer and about two miles away was Pop Robin's farm. He used to bring eggs and chickens and vegetables and fruit to the hotel. And oh my, wasn't he stingy? You'd better believe it. He wouldn't even give you two or three blackberries. If you asked him for an apple, he'd tremble all over. A regular old miser he was, with lots of money and a bully apple orchard. Let's go there some night and help ourselves says Billy Evans one day. Dog, says I. Only one, says he. I know him, and so do you, old Snaggletooth. 
I gave him almost all the meat we took for crab bait the day we didn't catch any. All right, says I. But when the night we'd agreed on came, Billy had cousins, girls, down from New York, and he had to stay home and entertain them. I don't care much for girls myself, and I was afraid they might want me to help entertain them too. So I made up my mind to go down to Pop Robin's alone. It was a splendid night. The moon shone so bright that it was almost as light as day. I scudded along, whistling away, until I got within half a mile of the orchard. And then I stopped my noise and walked as softly as possible, till I came to the first apple tree. I shinned up that tree in a jiffy. Old Snaggletooth didn't put in an appearance. Filled my bag with jolly fat apples and slid down again. But when I came to lift the bag up on my shoulder... I found it was awful heavy to carry so far, and I was just a-going to dump some of the apples out when I remembered all of a sudden that if I cut across the meadow to the plank road, I could get back to the hotel in a little more than half the time it would take to go the way I came. So I shouldered my load and was nearly across the meadow before I thought of the haunted barn at the end of it. It wasn't a nice thing to remember, but I wasn't a-going to turn back ghost or no ghost, and I tried to whistle again, when all at once that thing Al Smith was singing just now popped into my head, and says I to myself, that's so. Charles F. Bennett, you and your chums may think it's great fun to help yourselves to other people's apples and watermelons and such things, but it's just as much stealing as though you went into a man's house and stole his coat. It doesn't seem as bad when you're going for him, but when you're coming back, up a lonely road, all alone, at ten o'clock at night, a lot of stolen apples on your back, and a haunted barn not far off, it seems worse. All the same, I held on to the apples. And when I faced the barn, I determined I'd whistle if I died in the attempt. But boys, I don't believe anyone could have told that Yankee Doodle from Old Lang Syne. I tell you my heart jumped when I passed the tumble-down old place. But it stood still when, as I marched up the plank road, I heard a step behind me. I wheeled around in an instant, but there was nothing to be seen. The moon shone as bright as ever, but there was nothing to be seen. I must have imagined it, says I to myself, and I walked a little faster, listening with all my might, and sure enough, Pat, 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 came the step after me. Again, I wheeled around. Not a thing did I see. And again, I started on, the apples growing heavier and heavier. Pat, 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 came the step. It wasn't like a human step. That made it more dreadful. It must be the ghost, I thought. And I don't mind telling you, fellers, I never was so frightened in my life. The time I fell overboard was nothing to it. I made up my mind. When I reached the bridge that crossed a little brook near our hotel, I'd streak it. I hadn't exactly run yet, for I was saving my strength till the last. But before I got to the bridge, says I to myself, I must have said it out loud, though I didn't mean to, perhaps he wants the apples. Apples, repeated a hoarse voice with a horrid laugh. I tell you, boys, those apples flew and I flew too. Over the bridge I went like lightning and ran right into Barney Reardon, one of the stablemen, who was coming to look for me. Something has followed me, I gasp, from the haunted barn, the ghost. Did you see it? Says he. No, says I, though I turned around a dozen times to look for it. But I heard it, pat, 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 behind me all the way. And it's behind you now, says Barney, bursting into a loud laugh. I jumped about six feet. There it is, says Barney roaring again and pointing to Pop Robin's tame raven. The sly old thing looked up at me, nodded its shining black head, croaked, Apples! and walked off. It had followed me from the barn, and every time I wheeled quickly around, it hopped just as quickly behind me, and so, of course, I saw nothing but the long road and the moonlight on it. But I never want to be so scared again, and if ever any of you boys go for anything belonging to other people, don't count me in. What became of the apples? asked Jerry O'Neill. 
If you'd have been there, I could have told you, said Charlie. The House That Bell Built, or The Sad End of a Little Girl's Romance. Sitting alone in the firelight's flare, this is the house that Bell built. This is the girl with the golden hair that lived in the house that Bell built. This is the garden fresh and fair where played the girl with the golden hair that lived in the house that Bell built. These are the peaches sweet and rare that grew in the garden fresh and fair where played the girl with the golden hair that lived in the house that Bell built. This is the great and terrible bear that ate the peaches sweet and rare that grew in the garden fresh and fair where played the girl with the golden hair that lived in the house that Bell built. This is the prince with noble air who killed the great and terrible bear that ate the peaches sweet and rare that grew in the garden fresh and fair where played the girl with the golden hair that lived in the house that Bell built. This is the wedding beyond compare in which the prince of noble air who killed the great and terrible bear that ate the peaches so sweet and rare that grew in the garden fresh and fair married the girl with the golden hair that lived in the house that Bell built. This is the housemaid, Biddy McNair, with face so red and arms so bare, who took the poker without a care and slew the prince of noble air who killed the great and terrible bear that ate the peaches so sweet and rare that grew in the garden fresh and fair and married the girl with the golden hair that lived in the house that Bell built. End of Section 8 Recording by Vicki Pelton Estes Park, Colorado www.curiousbunny.com Section 9 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13, 1880. Flower Pots for Rooms fill a pot with coarse moss of any kind in the same manner as it would be filled with earth and place a cutting or a seed in this moss it will succeed admirably especially with plants destined to ornament a drawing-room in such a situation plants grown in moss will thrive better than in garden mould and possess the very great advantage of not causing dirt by the earth washing out of them when watered the explanation of this practice seems to be this that moss rammed into a pot and subjected to continual watering is soon brought into a state of decomposition when it becomes a very pure vegetable mould and it is well known that very pure vegetable mould is the most proper of all materials for the growth of almost all kinds of plants the moss would also not retain more moisture than precisely the quantity best adapted to the absorbent powers of the root a condition which can scarcely be obtained with any certainty by the use of earth the advantages of foreign tongues in the letters of charles dickens recently published occurs this pleasant child's story i heard of a little fellow the other day whose mamma had been telling him that a french governess was coming over to him from paris and had been expatiating on the blessings and advantages of having foreign tongues after leaning his plump little cheek against the window glass in a dreary little way for some minutes he looked round and inquired in a general way and not as if it had any special application whether she didn't think that the tower of babel was a great mistake altogether our post office box vancouver washington territory mamma takes the bazaar papa the weekly and magazine i have the first and second numbers of young people i like it very much but i like the brave swiss boy the best i am ten years old i saw in your letter to us that you wanted us to write to your paper i think it must have been very funny to come across the plains in a wagon 
i came across from fond du lac wisconsin where i was born in the cars and not in the long trains of wagons oro brown read two ways of putting it from the first number of young people in school last friday the pets i have are gray and maltese kittens i did once have a chicken that would come and eat wheat out of my hand and fly into my arms julia b i live a little way from scranton pennsylvania and a friend takes harper's young people for me i have had a great deal of fun trying to draw a pig with my eyes shut it is very funny to sit down with your eyes shut and try to feed another person with a spoon daisy middletown new york i wanted to write to you and tell you how much i liked your nice paper i like the story of the brave swiss boy best i live with my grandpa and grandma who are very good to me and i love them very much please print this and oblige harry w t pretty communications are received from frederick b brooklyn new york perkins s new york city annie l new london connecticut mary e r albany new york mabel l new york city and lottie s b boston massachusetts a m s as it may interest other young readers we print the whole list of portraits on the united states postage stamps in use at present as well as the one you require one cent franklin two cent jackson three cent washington five cent general taylor six cent lincoln seven cent stanton ten cent jefferson twelve cent clay fifteen cent webster twenty four cent scott thirty cent hamilton ninety cent commodore o h perry bessie g your brand pudding is excellent but it came too late for use we shall reserve it for next christmas as it is good enough to keep correct answers to christmas puzzle in number eight are received from charlie g g gussie l birdie c j n d fred a o herbert w b emily j m nina b f willie c herbert h isabella c van b and william w f the answer will be published in our next number the following easy puzzles from very young readers are offered for other very young readers to solve number one word square my first is a battle my second is a girl's name my third is not cooked k s nine years old number two enigma my first is in stove but not in coal my second is in pit but not in hole my third is in rod but not in pole my fourth is in bear and also in mole my fifth is in head but not in scroll my sixth is in steel and also in stole if you cannot guess this you are not witty for my hole is found in every city c g eleven years old number three numerical charade i am a word of ten letters my one two three four is a kind of labor my eight nine ten is a weight my six five seven is what a boy of a certain race is often called my hole was a great man r d c number four numerical charade i am a word of six letters my one five two is a noun my three four five is a biped my six one two is a verb my hole is a city in europe f c number five enigma my first is in cold but not in hot my second is in pan but not in pot my third is in nap but not in sleep my fourth is in sold but not in keep my fifth is in flute but not in drum my sixth is an example but not in sum my whole is useful in the dark m l number six double acrostic a girl's name a measure a fine net a girl's name a verb an explanation the answer is two cities of the united states m l number seven riddle decline ice cream m l number eight numerical charade i am composed of eighteen letters my seventeen eighteen nine is the latin name of an animal my sixteen ten four thirteen eight is a young animal my fourteen eleven is a prefix my six two twelve seven is a word applied to old clothes 
my one five three is a pronoun my fifteen is a vowel a good many little folks like my whole very much m e r answers to the above puzzles will be given in young people number fifteen end of section nine section ten of harper's young people volume one issue eleven january thirteenth eighteen eighty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b harper's young people volume one issue eleven january thirteenth nineteen eighty advertisements harper's young people harper's young people will be issued every tuesday and may be had at the following rates payable in advance postage free single copies four cents one subscription one year one dollar fifty cents five subscriptions one year seven dollars subscriptions may begin with any number when no time is specified it will be understood that the subscriber desires to commence with the number issued after the receipt of order remittances should be made by post office money order or draft to avoid risk of loss advertising the extent and character of the circulation of harper's young people will render it a first-class medium for advertising a limited number of approved advertisements will be inserted on two inside pages at seventy-five cents per line address harper and brothers franklin square new york a liberal offer for 1880 only harper's young people and harper's weekly will be sent to any address for one year commencing with the first number of harper's weekly for january 1880 on receipt of five dollars for the two periodicals fragrant sozodont is a composition of the purest and choicest ingredients of the vegetable kingdom it cleanses beautifies and preserves the teeth hardens and invigorates the gums and cools and refreshes the mouth every ingredient of this balsamic dentifrice has a beneficial effect on the teeth and gums impure breath caused by neglected teeth catarrh tobacco or spirits is not only neutralized but rendered fragrant by the daily use of sozodont it is as harmless as water and has been endorsed by the most scientific men of the day sold by druggists plays for young people with songs and choruses adapted for private theatricals with the music and necessary directions for getting them up sent on receipt of thirty cents by happy hours company number five beekman street new york send your address for a catalogue of tableau charades pantomimes plays reciters masks colored fire etc etc old books for young readers arabian nights entertainments the thousand and one nights or the arabian nights entertainments translated and arranged for family reading with explanatory notes by e w lane six hundred illustrations by harvey two volumes duodecimo cloth three dollars fifty cents robinson crusoe the life and surprising adventures of robinson crusoe of york mariner by daniel defoe with a biographical account of defoe illustrated by adams complete edition duodecimo cloth one dollar fifty cents the swiss family robinson the swiss family robinson or adventures of a father and mother and four sons on a desert island illustrated two volumes octodecimo cloth one dollar fifty cents the swiss family robinson continued being a sequel to the foregoing two volumes octodecimo cloth one dollar fifty cents sanford and merton the history of sanford and merton by thomas day octodecimo half bound seventy five cents published by harper and brothers new york harper and brothers will send any of the above works by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price the fairy books the princess idleways by mrs w j hayes illustrated sextodecimo cloth seventy five cents the catskill fairies by virginia w johnson octavo 
illuminated cloth gilt edges three dollars fairy book illustrated sextodecimo cloth one dollar fifty cents puss cat mew and other new fairy stories for my children by e h natchbull hugeson m p illustrated duodecimo cloth one dollar twenty five cents fairy book the best popular fairy stories selected and rendered anew by the author of john halifax illustrated duodecimo cloth one dollar twenty five cents fairy tales by jean masse translated by mary l booth illustrated duodecimo beveled edges one dollar seventy five cents gilt edges two dollars twenty five cents fairy tales of all nations by e la Boulet, translated by mary l booth illustrated duodecimo cloth beveled edges two dollars gilt edges two dollars fifty cents the little lame prince by the author of john halifax gentleman illustrated square sextodecimo cloth one dollar folks and fairies stories for little children by lucy crandall comfort illustrated square quarto cloth one dollar the adventures of a brownie as told to my child by the author of john halifax gentleman illustrated square sextodecimo cloth ninety cents published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price a book beyond the pale of criticism new york daily graphic the boy travelers in the far east adventures of two youths in a journey to japan and china illustrated octavo cloth three dollars a more attractive book for boys and girls can scarcely be imagined new york times the best thing for a boy who cannot go to china and japan is to get this book and read it philadelphia ledger juvenile literature seems to have come to a climax in this book in literary quality and in material form it is a decided improvement on anything of the kind ever before produced in america new york journal of commerce one of the richest and most entertaining books for young people both in text illustrations and binding which has ever come to our table providence press published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price what mr darwin saw in his voyage round the world in the ship beagle adapted for youthful readers illustrated octavo cloth three dollars a capital book on natural history for young readers hartford current a superb volume filled with maps and pictures of beasts birds and fishes as well as the faces of all sorts of men and with all this a most delightful story of real travel round the world by a very famous naturalist christian intelligencer new york to the intelligent boy or girl the book will be a perfect bonanza every statement it contains may be accepted as accurately true this book shows once more that truth is stranger than fiction philadelphia north american it can scarcely be opened anywhere without conveying interest and instruction s s times philadelphia published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price a nice gift for children pittsburgh telegraph the princess idleways a fairy story illustrated sextodecimo cloth seventy five cents written in a simple but charming manner and illustrated by beautiful pictures so that a youngster just past the first reading book would appreciate every word christian intelligencer new york the illustrations are worthy of special commendation any so airy pretty and full of grace have rarely appeared in any american book for children hartford current the language in which it is told is so pure and agreeable that parents and good bachelor uncles will find it a pleasure to read it aloud to the little ones boston courier published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price a most enchanting story for boys pittsburgh telegraph an involuntary voyage by lucien biart author of adventures of a young naturalist translated by mrs cashel hoey and mr john lilly illustrated duodecimo cloth one dollar twenty five cents 
a very charming book brimming full of adventures and has not an uninteresting page between its covers baltimore gazette a book that is at once novel and entertaining all the book is lively and the voyagers have some adventures the telling of which is as entertaining as any book of jules verne's besides having nothing in them that is improbable or extravagant philadelphia bulletin a most enchanting story for boys it is a story of adventure and also contains much interesting and useful information pittsburgh telegraph a narrative crowded with adventure told in the lively and graphic style for which the french writers of books for boys are so noted cleveland herald one of the most attractive books of the season spirited sketches of travel and adventure on the ocean wave among the islands and on southern coasts fill these chapters but the main point which gives them their highest flavor is the experience of naval warfare during our late civil conflict observer new york published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price a book for everybody ninth edition now ready how to get strong and how to stay so by william blakey with illustrations sextodecimo cloth one dollar your book is timely its large circulation cannot fail to be a great public benefit rev henry ward beecher it is a book of extraordinary merit in matter and style and does you great credit as a thinker and writer hon calvin e pratt of the new york supreme bench a capital little treatise it is the very book for ministers to study rev theodore l coiler d d in new york evangelist it is unquestionably one of the most practical and useful books on this topic which have ever been published in this country new york evening express we know of no man in america more capable of writing such a book or who has a better right to do so rutland daily herald and globe it will pay any person whether a farmer or lawyer laborer or idler schoolgirl or housewife to buy and read it and follow its teachings springfield union a veritable treasury of muscular common sense charleston news and courier published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price End of section 10section 11 of harper's young people volume 1 issue 11 january 13th 1880 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by vicky pelton esses park colorado w w w curiousbunny com Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13, 1880 The Egg Tombola A very amusing toy can be made out of an egg, to resemble figure 1 in our picture. The one from which our drawing is copied was constructed in half an hour. The way to do it is this. Get a clean, well-shaped fresh egg. With a strong needle, make a hole at each end about the size of a large shot then suck out the contents of the egg. Now you have the hollow shell. Through one of the holes, drop in about half a teaspoonful of shot and the same quantity of pellets of beeswax or tallow. Now take a small bit of bread and work it between the fingers till it becomes a paste. With this, stop up the hole at the big end of the egg. Then procure a cup of boiling water and hold the egg in it till the wax is melted taking care to hold it quite upright so that all the shot will settle in the big end. This will take about five minutes. Then hold the egg in very cold water till the wax is cooled. This will take about five minutes more. You will now find that the egg will stand upright on the table, no matter in what position you may lay it down. The next thing is to paint or draw on it the figure of an old gentleman like our picture, and you have the tombola complete. If the figure be painted with oil colors, the tombola can be made to perform his pranks in a basin of water. Figure 2 shows the interior of the egg 
and the position of the shot and wax. Stories of Dogs We are sure all young people will read with pleasure the following description of a very remarkable dog, which belonged to the Honorable Alexander H. Stevens. This dog, which is mentioned in The Life of Stevens, was a very large and fine white poodle named Rio, a dog of unusual intelligence and affection, to which Mr. Stevens became very strongly attached. While Mr. Stevens was in Washington, Rio stayed with Linton Stevens at Sparta, Georgia, until his master returned. Mr. Stevens would usually come on during the session of Greene County Court, where Linton would meet him, having Rio with him in his buggy, and the dog would then return with his master. When this has happened once or twice, the dog learned to expect him on these occasions. The cars usually arrived at about 9 o'clock at night. During the evening, Rio would be extremely restless, and at the first sound of the approaching train, he would rush from the hotel to the depot, and in a few seconds would know whether his master was on the train or not, for he would search for him through all the cars. He was well known to the conductors, and if the train happened to start before Rio had finished his search, they would stop to let him out. But when his search was successful, his raptures of joy at seeing his master again were really affecting. His intelligence was so great that he seemed to understand whatever was said to him. At a word, he would shut a door as gently as a careful servant might have done, or would bring a cane, hat, or umbrella. He always slept in his master's room, which he scarcely left during Mr. Stevens' attacks of illness. In a word, Mr. Stevens found him in a companion of almost human intelligence, and of unbounded affection and fidelity, and the tie between man and the dog was strong and enduring. For nearly 13 years he was, says Mr. Stevens, my constant companion. When at home, day and night, and until he became blind a few years ago, he always attended me wherever I went, except to Washington. You may well imagine then how I miss him. Miss him in the yard, in the house, in my walks. For though blind, he used to follow me about the lot wherever I went. When I was reading or writing, he was always at my feet. At night, too, his bed was at the foot of my own. His beautiful white thick coat of wool was soft as silk. Who that knew him, as I did, could refrain from shedding a tear for poor Rio? Of course, he was properly interred, in a coffin, in the garden, and placed in the position in which he usually slept, with his face on his forefeet. The smartest Newfoundland dog yet discovered lives at Haverhill, Massachusetts. He meets the newsboy at the gate every morning and carries his master's paper into the house. That is, he did so until the other day when his master stopped taking the paper. The next morning, the dog noticing the boy passing on the other side without leaving the newspaper, went over and took the whole bundle from him and carried them into the house. That's the kind of dog he is. End of section 11. Recording by Vicki Pelton. Estes Park, Colorado. www.curiousbunny.com End of Harper's Young People. Volume 1, Issue 11, January 13, 1880.